anyway, Tom, thank you. Welcome. It's a pleasure to, I guess, talk to you in, in, in I guess, somewhat real life. I've, I've kind of interacted with you online quite a bit and been a yeah. fan of some of the work you've done in years past. And so well, thank you. Uh, for some that don't know you, Tom, I mean, you you did uh, a number of things over the years. One, I think many people, at least in the low-carb community, are familiar with the work you did regarding uh, Fathead, the movie, and I thought right. that was quite interesting. Would you be kind enough to uh, sh fill us in a little bit in your background for those folks that aren't familiar with you? Sure. Oh, my background. Well, we don't have all day, so uh, I will say at various times, I've been uh, a stand-up comedian, which is what I was when I started making Fathead. I'm a, a software engineer. I've worked a variety of, of other jobs. Uh, I guess you'd have to say I'm easily bored because I, I kept uh, switching car careers dramatically there for a while. But uh, currently still a software engineer and Fathead just kind of began as a little pet project for me that, that kept growing. And just, you know, what was the inspiration for Fathead? I mean, my assumption is, you know, Morgan Spurlock made a movie called Supersize Me where he went to McDonald's and ate a bunch of food and got out of shape and, and fat. And did that have some influence on you? Was it that, had some influence, you? but it, um, I, it didn't. What became Fathead didn't start out as Fathead. I was a stand-up comedian at the time, and I was living in L.A. and going to auditions and I kept getting close to being cast and things. They'd get down to one or two of us and pick the other guy. And I finally thought, well, I'm going to do what a lot of actors do. You know, you just kind of create your own show and go from there. So the idea I had for a show was going to be called In Defense of Common Sense. Uh, average but funny guy looks at issues of the day and comments on them. The first issue that I chose was how we treat fat people in American society. And, and I was planning to do this whole thing as like a half hour pilot episode. And when I was doing research, I thought, well, I've never watched Super Size Me. I should, should probably watch this since people are talking about it. I watched Super Size Me and it, I thought that it was an amusing, but it also annoyed me so much that I thought, well, now I want to do a reply to this. So that kind of switched me from let's do a half hour pilot episode to let's do a kind of a documentary reply to Super Size Me. And then as I was researching diet, health, what actually makes a good diet and what doesn't, that's when I began to come across a whole lot of convincing research that said all this dietary advice from the USDA, cut your saturated fat, avoid meat, eat those healthy grains is actually wrong. And the more I looked into it, the more I became convinced. So kind of the second half of Fathead became really that, uh, you know, first half, here's why Super Size Me was full of it. And second half, here's why your government dietary advice is full of it too. So it, it just kind of kept evolving as I was working on it. Yeah. And I, and I, and I saw, well, both films, actually, I saw Super Size Me, I think because it's been many years, I don't remember exactly, but what was the point, what were the particular particulars that annoyed you about the, the Super Size Me film? So first off, he had a phrase, where does personal responsibility end and corporate responsibility begin as if it's McDonald's responsibility to help you eat well? My answer to that question is never. Personal responsibility on what you put in your mouth never ends. Just because McDonald's is offering it doesn't mean you need to eat it. And as I had people in Fathead say when I was doing street interviews, well, what if McDonald's offered broccoli and carrots? They said, well, then I wouldn't go there. <laughs> I don't go to McDonald's for carrots. That was one thing that annoyed me. Also, uh, again, I'm a software engineer. Do not throw bad math at me and expect me not to notice. So he uh, claimed he was just going to eat. He would only eat what was on the menu. He would only eat three meals a day. He would only supersize if they asked him, which he only did. They only asked him nine times that month. Meanwhile, his nutritionist tells him twice on camera, you're eating more than 5,000 calories per day. And immediately mathematical alarm bells start going ding, 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 ding. You can't eat 5,000 uh, calories a day at McDonald's. If you're eating normal meals from the menu, you only supersize nine times. Absolutely does not add up. So I showed that in the film. So in other words, he was full of crap. He stuffed himself with way more than three meals a day. Either that or he was slamming down sodas and shakes or something to get up to the 5,000. And then he blames McDonald's for their high calorie meals. Well, yes, they are high calorie meals, but they're not that high calorie. So just the dishonesty of it. And also living in LA and knowing a few people in show business, I had heard things about Spurlock anyway, not exactly the most 
honest man in the world when it comes to these things. So, and and then so you're again your I guess rebuttal documentary. I mean, you went into McDonald's and and I can't remember. You just didn't didn't eat the French fries. You kind of you kind of did a low carb McDonald's approach. Is that is that basically? What I, you I did, did a lowish carb. So I did eat some French fries, and you know some people who either didn't really watch the film or didn't remember said, well, of course. He kept his calories down. He didn't eat any hamburger buns. Yes, yes, I did. <laughs> I would go in and order a double cheeseburger with the bun. I might order two of the McDoubles. And instead of having two sandwiches with two buns, I would put them on one bun. So I limited my carbs. I didn't cut them completely. I limited them to about an average of 100 per day. And of course, I didn't, you know, slam down 32 ounce uh, Coca-Colas, which I don't care if McDonald's selling them, if 7 Eleven selling them, anyone who, who doesn't realize that a 32 ounce glass of Coca Cola is not good for you uh, has other problems. Yeah, I, you know, and I, I wrote, you know, in, in a book I wrote, The Carnivore Diet, one of the things I talked about was the fact that, you know, we, you know, I think beef is a healthy product and we have a built in distribution system throughout the country. I mean, we've got their McDonald's and every, every small town has a McDonald's. I mean, it's, yeah. and it's relatively cheap. And so I think that could very well be a, uh, uh, a part of a solution rather than part of the cause, because obviously, like you said, we don't go to McDonald's for health food, but right. there is, in fact, some health food on the menu, at least in my view. I um, agree. So what was the uh, and so, the, uh, you know, obviously, I think the Fathead movie was was well received, at least in my experience, at least within the, well, the low carb community. Um, was there any pushback in like the mainstream? Like, I don't know if it was it Netflix or how did that, how did that evolve? Were they not interested to hear this or? Uh, no, it actually had a successful run on Netflix. In fact, until it went to Netflix, I thought I had sunk a whole lot of my own money into making this little independent film and I was never going to make my money back. Um, and partly that was, we had issues with not one, but two distributors who, who weren't paying us. But it was when I finally managed to get away from one of the dishonest, as it turned out, distributors into the hands of the distributor we have now, Gravitas, good, honest people. And they put it on Netflix. And that's when it went kaboom. And that was almost two years after it had been released. And when it went to Netflix, that's when I would wake up in the morning and my, my email inbox would have 200 emails in it. You know, that's when I realized it was getting to people. And, and as far as pushback, yes, I have, of course, heard from the uh, the vegan crowd, you know, <laughs> I would get angry emails from vegans, how dare you promote the evil corporation selling me, you know, blah, 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 stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, I was going to wonder, those 200 yeah. emails you're getting, how many of them are, you know, you're a murderer, axe murderer, you know, whatever. <laughs> yeah, I certainly got those. But here's the thing. And and this I honestly did not expect when I when I made Fathead, I made it as a what I hoped was an amusing and informative documentary. Here's what I never expected. I started getting emails from people saying, you saved my life. I watched your, your film. It inspired me to go do my own research on diet and health. I changed my diet. I've lost 50 pounds. I'm, uh, I'm no longer have symptoms of type two diabetes. But thank you so much for making this. You saved my life, which, which blew me away. And believe me, I'll take one of those over 500. I hate you because you're promoting meat emails any day of the week. I mean, I, 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 frankly, I don't care what the vegans think. Uh, but when you hear from people, you say, for my life, that makes all the difference in the world. Yeah, I'm into that. And, I, and amen and a woman to that <laughs> as I, I see that stuff all the time. So and then, you know, I guess obviously this wasn't a main focus of yours to sort of become a nutritional advocate i don't assume i mean this is just to make a comment on obesity as, as a comedian and and so it seems like you know you you kind of grew from that i know you had a, you had some books on this or something like that as well so and, uh, we we ended up producing uh we i say uh we because i i write and my my wife's an artist so we produced an illustrated book for kids called fathead kids because i heard from a lot of people um boy, my kids love fathead and they're really thinking differently about diet. And I thought, you know, that's, that's fascinating because I certainly wish I'd known this stuff when I was a kid, I could have avoided a lot of heartache. You know, I was the fat kid with the boobs and the, the weak skinny arms. Uh, and it's so much easier to prevent the damage than it is to unwind it when you, when you're an adult. So we, we produced the book fathead kids, which is 
a fun cartoon illustrated book, although a lot of adults have told me they learned from it. And then as soon as the book was done, we immediately turned around and turned it into an animated film called Fathead Kids. Yeah, and so, um, and, and this has been, I guess, what, three or four or five years ago since this came out, Tom? When did that, when did that well, come out? Well, the original Fathead was 2009. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, which, the, years, talk about me years. feeling old, people have started referring to it as a classic. And I'm thinking, when, when people say your film is a classic, you're getting up there in years. Um, Fathead Kids was, I think, three years ago for the book and two years ago for the film. You know, one of the things with, I think, with comedians and, you know, I, 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 good comedians, you know, I think it takes a lot of intelligence. You know, I'm always impressed because you have to be able to understand what's going on and then be able to, to do something, you know, that, that, you know, makes people laugh about that. But I mean, you, you, you see some of the top comedians, they're kind of like, you know, uh, they kind of keep an eye on society in general. You know, the commentary right. is kind of like, why is this so crazy? Um, I feel like I'm living in a bad Monty Python skit these days. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, very, very much now. <laughs> and I know I've seen, you know, yeah, I think we share some similar views, but I mean, um, what are your thoughts on just in general? I mean, the last, obviously the last year we went through this crazy, crazy time. We're still sort of, it seems to be in some of this stuff. Um, hopefully you don't mind discussing some of this stuff. I know it's kind of, I don't mind at all, but, but what are, what are your concerns? I mean, I know, I know, like I said, some of this stuff is, is, uh, uh, you know, you're, 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 I know you're referencing like the Babylon Bee and, uh, you yeah. know, the onion and things like that. I mean, and it's almost truth is stranger than fiction, you know, in some of these cases. But what are, you, what, are your, what are some of the interesting observations you've seen over the last, you know, last, last year? Well, so first, I want to respond to what you said about comedians seem like in, intelligent people. Um, yes, um, w with, with one exception. There are the comedians who make you laugh through being clever, and there are the comedians who make you laugh through four-letter words. Um, and, and some mix them, but I mean, there are comedians who's they rely totally on what we in the business call dick jokes to get people to laugh. I, I don't generally find them to be that intelligent, but the, the people who make you laugh by being clever, I was on the road with a lot of those, those guys and, and women. There's not a, there was not a one of them that was not highly, highly intelligent. It takes a different level of the brain to come up with stuff that's, that's truly funny. Um, which is why I, I used to crack me up when people, why would I take advice from you? You're just a comedian. Well, <laughs> because uh, I, yes, I am a comedian, which means I, I have a high level of intelligence because all the good ones do. And second, I'm not just a comedian. I'm also a software engineer. I know how to analyze things. Um, but as far as what's going on today, I know a lot of people are surprised and, and shocked. Uh, I'm not. I saw it coming. The reason being, I'm a huge fan of, well, I read a lot, but I'm a huge fan of Thomas Sowell and his book, The Vision of the Anointed. And this is exactly how the anointed operate. Uh, for years, I've been a huge fan of Eric Hoffer's book, The True Believer, which he wrote in the 50s, but it's still relevant today. I'm a huge fan of Dr. Stephen Hicks's book, Understanding Postmodernism, on how they think and what they want, he, which he wrote, I think, about 20 years ago. And basically, I'm seeing kind of the predictions of those authors coming true. Uh, it happened faster than I thought it would. But I, I'm not surprised at the direction it's going. And in the direction it's going is um, they want to take away our freedom to make our own decisions. And they are using COVID as an excuse to do so. Um, COVID came along and basically gave them an excuse to do everything they wanted. More control over businesses, more control over individuals. I promise you telling you what you're allowed to eat is coming. Um, we'll we'll I, I don't think they'll rush into that one too soon. It's kind of like, you know, the boil a frog theory. If you throw a frog into the boiling water, he'll jump out. But if you put him in the water and you turn it up a degree at the time, he'll just sit there. We're the frogs and we're being slowly boiled and they're slowly turning up the temperature by slowly taking away a little freedom here, a little freedom here, a little freedom here. And as long as they take away your freedom one little bit at a time, nobody really wants to revolt. Um, it's like, okay, it's, it's, it's one more little bit of freedom that went away. I'll, I'll deal with it. Whereas if they tried to take away all your freedom at once, people would revolt. Uh, and by revolt, I don't necessarily mean pick up muskets and, you know, go, go storm the barricades, but I mean, we'd throw them out of office. People would, 
resist massively, but they keep doing it a little bit at a time. And I'm absolutely convinced it's intentional. Yeah, you're not, I mean, you're not alone in that, Tom. I mean, there's a lot of- Someone's people. clapping up there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there. I mean, there's a lot of people that, that certainly are concerned about those things. And we see that, you know, there's, you know, it's like, well, you know, just wear a mask is for the greater good, you know, not a big deal. It's not that much of an inconvenience. It's not going to kill you. And, you know, and I, as a surgeon, I wear a mask my whole career. It doesn't bother me to put a mask on. I, again, I say, I don't know that the, the, the value that it's being portrayed as being helpful is helpful, but, you know, now they're, now the next thing is, you know, get a vaccine for grandma, you know, get a, get a, you get a vaccine right. for someone else's health, which to me, I think that's a very, very disturbing line. And I think if, if, if that becomes forced upon us, and I think we've really lost the plot, um, you know, and, and again, I'm, I'm not necessarily anti-vaccine. I just want to say that we should have the freedom to make our own health decisions. And if someone is, you know, like I said, we, right now we have a, a vaccine that's not even FDA approved. It's been approved right. for emergency use. So, right. Like I said, it's not been vetted like we would normally do. It's just an emergency use thing. So that's, I mean, I, I'm hearing about places like Madison Square Garden where you can't go in without a vac vaccine passport. Or do you think there's any way to unwind this? I mean, is it possible? You know, you talked about unwinding the damage when you're older from a nutritional right, standpoint. Yeah. Can we as a society um, sort of say, put the brakes on and say, wait a minute, this is, this is, uh, you know, a bridge too far and we're not willing to go down there. Do you think that, do you think it, do you think the die is already well, cast? We can, but here's the thing. We're going to have to get, if not a majority, a significant minority of people to just begin to flat out resist. And again, by resisting, I don't necessarily mean picking up muskets. I mean, I mean, just saying hell no. Um, so on, on, on the vaccine thing, uh, I'm not an anti-vaxxer either. Um, people like to, w when I question the, the vaccine and I explain why I know I'm not going to get it, a lot of people want to just write me off as anti-vaxxer. And by the way, when I said I admire books like Explaining Postmodernism, one thing he explains in there is that um, they, they think name calling is an argument. Um, and they often revert to name calling as if, you know, I mean, how many times do you take up a position and someone just th says you're a Nazi and they think they've made an argument? They haven't. They just called you a name. So a lot of people are just throwing out anti-vaxxer when I question uh, the vaccine. I'm not an anti-vaxxer. My kids had their childhood vaccinations. Um, I question the need for this vaccine, and I don't question it for everyone. Frankly, uh, my wife's mother-in-law is 76 years old. She has asthma. She is the type of person who really could succumb to COVID. And, she, you know, she ran out and got the vaccine, and I, I totally get it. Um, but I am 62, and I'm radiantly healthy. Uh, I rarely feel sick for anything. I haven't had the flu that I've noticed in more than 20 years. My vitamin D status is good. I exercise. I eat right. The odds of COVID killing me are so incredibly small, they're not even worth considering. So why would I put a novel, untested vaccine? It's not even really a vaccine, I don't think. It's a some sort of uh, gene therapy, if I'm if I'm understanding it correctly, why, why would I do that to myself to protect myself from what? That's to me, that's like protecting myself from getting struck by lightning. The odds are so small, it's not worth considering. But this is the part that bugs me. I'm now hearing, you know, on Twitter, uh, people saying, if you don't get the vaccine, you're being selfish. And I'm thinking, why? You, you're telling me this vaccine is safe and effective. So everyone who feels threatened you go out and get it. And if this vaccine is safe and it is effective, even if I don't get the vaccine, I'm, at abs I'm absolutely no threat to you because you've been vaccinated. And yet they're, they're trying to push the idea. Everyone should get the vaccine. Kids should get the vaccine. Seriously, kids who are more likely to die from seasonal flu than from COVID, they're supposed to get the vaccine. So I think kind of like with statins, this is about producing billions in drug sales, uh, not so much about making everyone healthy, because I think there are a fairly limited number of people who really, truly need to take the vaccine. Yeah, I, I think I saw a, a statistic where I think Moderna and Pfizer are slated to, you know, produce about $32 billion in sales this, just this year, right. 2021, on right. vaccine sales. And so, and, you know, 
what I think is probably going to see, we're going to see is this is going to be a recurring thing for which seasonal variations are going to come yeah. in. They're going to continue yeah. to possibly mandate this. And, you know, and, 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 you know, why you say you're not going to take it, you know, they very well could say, well, well, Tom, guess what? You don't get to work in this particular job. Right. You don't get to, you don't get to fly overseas. Right. You may not be able to fly to certain States, depending on what state it is. Right. Um, so how do you, I mean, I mean, I'm just wondering how, you know, how you push back on that sort of, sort of coercion. I mean, if there's civil liberal, I can imagine there'd be a lot of lawsuits filed in, in, in the U S but I mean, you know, there's a lot of countries like, you know, flat out, I think like Indonesia, they're, they're, they're literally just taking away rights from you if you don't take in a vaccine or they're fining you, I think the equivalent of U S $450, which I can ma- imagine in Indonesia is a hell of a lot of money. And so, are you yeah, I would think about this, some of these, some of these, uh, denial of entry can you imagine i mean show me your papers to get into the grocery store is that is that something we're going to be seeing uh if the people who are behind this had their way yes it would be again they won't go there right away uh, again that they know to slowly boil the frog i mean how do we stop it again it's going to take math massive resistance by by the rest of us um and we know that that works because during the whole black lives matter marches slash riots, uh, they weren't supposed to be out in the streets. Nobody else was allowed out in the streets, but there were so many of them that the authorities just backed off and said, we're we're not going to do anything about it. So if we resist as individuals, they will pick us off one at a time. But if a thousand people show up at a airport and say, no, I'm not vaccinated and no, you're not stopping me from getting in, they're going to back away. Uh, When enough people resist, the authorities do back away. Here's the thing. Everyone's like, oh, my God, it's the government. They can stop you from doing anything. What what most people don't realize is there aren't actually that many cops in the country. Uh, There aren't even actually that many soldiers in the military. If a huge chunk of the population rises up and says, we're not putting up with this, they back away and they will back away. And the other thing is, and unfortunately, I'm not sure if this will happen to me, the instant cure, not instant, but the quick cure is let's throw these bastards the hell out of office. Uh, But I don't know if that'll happen because a lot of people are caught up in the fear and they're, you know, they're fully invested in it. Yeah. I mean, there's, like I said, you live in LA. Where do you live by the way now, Tom? I know you moved out to the country somewhere, if I'm not mistaken. Is that right? Oh, I escaped from L.A. when my daughter entered kindergarten. You know, I started seriously considering, do I want my kids to be L.A. kids? Uh, The answer was no. And also by that point, I had already made Fathead and I realized that I could have made it anywhere, really. There was no reason to be in L.A. And second, I saw California becoming even more of the People's Republic of California. So I just talked about it with my wife and I said, I want to get out of here. And she totally agreed. So we we fled to Tennessee. We're just south of Nashville. And are you are you kind of in a rural setting? Is that is that where you're at right now? We are. Yeah, we actually have a little uh, hobby farm, which we're not farming as a hobby or anything else at the moment because we have other projects going on. But yeah, we're we're on six acres. Uh, my wife has huge gardens. We we were raising chickens uh, for the eggs. The chickens somewhat recently uh, got wiped out by raccoons. Um, so we've been doing this for, <clears throat> for several years and we will get back to it. Pardon me. But my wife said, I kind of want to break from, from being responsible for chickens because it was really her job, not mine. So we're taking a break from it, but we'll get back to it. Yeah, I hear, I hear the predators like chickens a lot. They're hard to keep protected. They taste like chicken, that's why. Yeah, they taste like chicken, that's right. So you would mentioned, you know, you think that they're going to be coming after, you know, telling us what to eat, you know, yeah. you know, we already have, you know, the, the dietary guidelines, which is kind of like telling us what to eat, but, but most people I think largely ignore that stuff, but, you know, unless you're a poor kid going to school and you don't have a choice in your school lunch program or you're a prisoner or in the military perhaps, but right. the majority of that, the dietary guidelines don't have. So how are they going to um, quote unquote, tell us what to eat? What do you, I mean, I know there's eat Lancet, there's, there's stuff like that, but where do you see that? How do you see that rolling out? Well, that's the scary thing about the Eat Lancet document. Uh, You know, if you read it, I did. I know you did. You know, they start talking about, well, we may have to apply the levers of government. Well, that that just, (laughs) I mean, what a a kind euphemism, the levers of government. What that means is the government's going to say you're only allowed to buy so much meat per week. 
Um, and they're going to do this. And it's not just them. It's the World Economic Forum has been pushing this whole idea for years um, that we must limit meat to save the planet, <clears throat> which, as, as you know, is hogwash, pardon the pun. Um, so it's going to turn into we have to do this to save the planet. We're only going to allow you to buy, you know, as an individual X number of ounces of meat per week because we have to save the planet. Um, so, you know, they'll come up with a ration card or something, which will, of course, produce a huge black market and everything else that automatically goes along with that. But I at this point, I do not put it past. I don't put it past them to start doing it through legislation. Now, the good thing is, I think there would be several states, including mine, <laughs> certainly Texas, that would say we're not going along. Um, but again, they will boil the frog slowly. So, I mean, I even said on Twitter when this whole censorship thing came around, um, I said to, to people who were, oh, they have to do it. They're preventing revolution and all kinds of other nonsense. I said, if you're going to favor censorship now, you have no right to complain when people like Sean Baker start getting blocked because he's promoting meat and that's bad for the planet. And I, I got, oh, you're being ridiculous. That would never happen. Yeah, yes, yes, it would. They blocked people for saying vitamin D would help prevent COVID infection. I mean, was that wrong? No. Second, even if it was wrong, what's the fear? People are going to take, are going to accidentally get their vitamin D status up. So uh, th there's really nothing they won't censor uh, if it doesn't fit the agenda. And again, they will just do it slowly. They'll start picking this off, you know, one degree at a time. Speaking of censorship, you know, it seems like uh, comedians and I'll use like South Park as, a, you know, as, as those guys are basically comedians. I mean, they were doing a, doing a satirical cartoon and basically they, they broach topics that many people in normal discussion would not be allowed to have. I mean, they would be. Right aggressively going after do you see that even within the, the the realm of comedy we're seeing censorship are, are comedians now sort of pulling back on what they would normally say is has there been a palpable change in in the discourse among comedians I, I i would say it's not so much that comedians are pulling back it's that the venues are are forcing them to pull back their comedians aren't doing it voluntarily um it, it should tell you something when Jerry Seinfeld, who was hardly the most controversial comedian in the world, said he will no longer perform at colleges because they put so many restrictions on what you can and cannot say. And it, it wasn't him, but some comedian tweeted part of a contract that a college had sent. If, you know, if you're going to perform, you cannot insult the following groups. And it was this, this huge list of groups that you could not insult. And I'm sorry, I don't remember which comedian said it, but it was true. He said, what these people don't understand is that every joke has a target. I mean, you can, you can be the nicest, most unthreatening comedian in, in the world. You can be John Mulaney, but your joke still has a target. And what these people are saying is most of the targets are now off limits because we don't want people's feelings to get hurt. Well, first off, part of the job of, of a comedian is to hurt people's feelings. It's to point out what is ridiculous about life and about people. Um, and, and second, I'm sorry, if you are that sensitive that you can't take a joke, and we all know that there are really, truly mean-spirited jokes, and I don't have any problem avoiding those. I did it when I was a comedian anyway. But there are jokes with targets where if the targets are not whiny little children, they're going to laugh as opposed to being upset. And I'm afraid we are conditioning people to remain in permanent toddlerhood where mommy, mommy, he said a bad thing about me. I'm going to go to my room and cry. That's fine when you're three years old. It's not fine when you're 23 years old. Um, so I, I, I am worried about what's, and I'm not a working comedian anymore, so it's not affecting me personally. I'm worried about it from the aspect of people, if we're going to get that serious, life is not going to be fun. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, I, I see like some of the, you know, you said mommy, mommy. I mean, now that's that's considered, <laughs> believe it or not, that's considered potentially problematic speech, you know, that you, yeah. that you actually refer to someone as a mom or a dad is, is yeah, just, yeah. <laughs> it's, just, it's gotten so bizarre to me. I mean, it's, I see it's, like, it's I, insane. I, I saw there was a, there was a private school in New York and, and they basically had a list of 
preferred terms and mother and father was not um, among that list. You know, it's yeah. like other than, and, you know, I made a joke with my kid. I said, Hey, stop calling me dad. You got to call me big, big parent, you know, <laughs> I'm a little parent because I'm, you know, it's just gotten bizarre the way we've kind of, kind of, kind of, you know, and there's people that are, that are lining up for this. I mean, it's like, they're, they're, they're like the frogs and they're, they're, they're the frogs and they're turning the heat up themselves. They're like, they're like, Oh yeah, they, absolutely. And here's the other thing. Um, the goalposts not only shift constantly, we are supposed to somehow magically intuit where, where they are now. Uh, so something that would not have been problematic maybe a year ago is suddenly becomes problematic and you're just supposed to know, you know, it's not like there's a rule book written down somewhere. You're just supposed to know. And if you violate this rule, which somehow morphed overnight, now you're a bad person. Um, Here's the, the issue with the, the woke crowd, the same crowd that's behind Corona hysteria. I mean, to a large degree, they're, they're the same people. There is no stopping point. There is never a point where they say, okay, we've taken enough of your money and your freedom now. We're going to stop. They will never stop, which is why the people who keep giving in a little bit at a time thinking... Uh, okay, they're going to stop now. No, 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 they're not. And uh, I, I hesitate to use this analogy because, oh my God, you'll get in trouble if you bring up the Holocaust in an analogy. But um, I'm a World War II buff. And I'm a huge World War II buff. Um, and I've read, I don't even know how many books, autobiographies, et cetera, et cetera. Here's what some of the Jews who survived said. Yes, we saw them taking away our liberty and coming after us. And each time they did it, we thought this is where they stop, which is why they didn't revolt much, much sooner. Okay, now they're taking away, the, but they're going to stop now. Well, okay, now they're taking, but they're going to stop. They kept convincing themselves this is where they'll stop. These authoritarian types do not stop. So each time you give in thinking, oh, they're going to stop now, you're, you're wrong. Each time they move it and then you give in, you're giving them permission to take away a little more. And then you don't, re you, you don't resist because, okay, this is where they'll stop. No, that's not where they're going to stop. You just told them they can take you another step. So it will keep going and going, whether we're talking, uh, you know, Eat Lancet, World Economic Forum, the woke crowd, all the people who basically want to take away your, your freedom to make your own decisions because, by gosh, you'll make the wrong decisions. They will never stop. And uh, what a lot of people, I think, don't understand is that liberty is not the natural way of things. You know, throughout human history, being, a, being free to live your life and make your own decisions, that is not how most people have lived, at least not since societies began. And people who grew up in a free society kind of think it's the natural order of things and that we can give up a little liberty here and there and we're going to be fine. No, you, you have lived in a brilliant peak of human history where in most of the world, people were free to make their own decisions. It is not the natural order of things. It is a rare, wonderful, beautiful thing that you grew up in this era and you're going to let it slip away a little bit at a time if you don't start resisting having it taken away. Yeah, I've, I've said, you know, with things like regarding like things like Meatless Mondays, and I know right. I, I've been critical. There's a governor in, in uh, Colorado, Governor Jared Paulus, who said we're going to have a, you know, a vegan day. You know, and most people say that's oh, no big deal. I'm of the opinion you, you don't give them an inch. Like you said, you know, you give right. them an inch, they take a mile type of situation. And so right. I'm glad to see, you know, at least, you know, and again, there's a lot of different aspects, but a number of other states have come out, Nebraska, Wyoming, hopefully others will join and say, no, we're going to make March 20th or support your rancher, eat more meat day. And I think that's, right. I think instead of playing defense, we have to play offense. And so Agreed. it's like, you know, yeah. you just have to push it the other way and get aggressive about this and not be timid and not be passive and not just say, well, it's not that big of an issue to me. You know, I think it's something that, uh, you know, hopefully more people do. I think the problem and, and one of the things we, you know, you talked about muskets and revolts and all that type of thing. That occurs when you have a when you've got a hungry population. We have a complacent population. You know, we have right. a, we have a comfortable population that can watch right. Netflix and order pizzas, uh, not fathead pizzas, by the way, but regular pizzas. <laughs> right. Um, you know, uh, you know, and, and it's just like okay, I've got my video game, I've got my Netflix, I've got you know 
cheap, cheap, tasty food. What more do I need? And I think that's a, that's a huge, um, you know, a huge difficulty to overcome. Right. The Roman emperors knew to provide food and entertainment to yeah, keep, a, keep the population compliant. It's not like this hasn't happened before. Um, I think, again, what it's going to take is a, not necessarily a majority of people, a large, loud minority of people, people like, like you, like me, and, and, and your friends up there who understand that freedom is precious and I'm not willing to trade it for a pizza and a night of Netflix. And, and I hope there are enough of us. Yeah. And that is a thing. And, and hopefully, you know, I, I know there's been, <laughs> it, it gets difficult to organize, you know, like I said, they're there, they make it, you know, they, you know, they close down all the, uh, I guess during the revolutionary war, people met in taverns and right. restaurants and, you know, that types of places where they plotted their, <laughs> <laughs> so they'll close activity. the taverns and restaurants now <laughs> right exactly so yeah. you can't get out and talk and talk amongst yourselves so um what you know you, you you said yourself so you're working as a software engineer do you have any more further plans to do any more satirical comedic stuff more media stuff that is that in the works for you tom no at this point no um and in fact, I back in December, I even put up a final post on my Fathead blog saying, you know, I, I think I've said what I want to say on this subject. Thanks for the memories. I'm done. I have a full time job as a software engineer. I was writing books, producing videos, giving speeches. Um, I also have a software business where I produce a product that uh, trademark and patent firms use to keep track of their trademarks and patents. Essentially, for a, a good 20 years, I have been putting in the hours of someone who has two jobs. Um, and I'm 62 now. My daughter goes to college this year. I'm kind of feeling like I need to go into a bit of semi-retirement, which for me means only putting in the hours of someone who has a job and a half. Um, so I'm doing my my full-time software engineer job. I'm working on the software product that I sell. I'm active on Twitter, as you know. But as far as producing more films, videos, whatever, I suspect I'll come back to that someday simply because, like most comedians, entertainers, I have a lot of creative energy. And at some point, that energy insists on going somewhere. Uh, but for now, I think I need a good long break from it. And when people have asked, well, what's going to be next? What's your next plan? Uh, I don't know. And actually, for the first time in my adult life, I'm perfectly content to not know what my next creative project is. Because, I mean, for most of it, while I was working on one project, I always had two others in mind. Uh, and right now, I don't. And I'm, I'm fine with it. Uh, I will come back and do something. I just don't know what it'll be. And I'm in no hurry to find out. Yeah. So what, so given you're in the semi-retirement of working one and a half jobs, what, I mean, what is, what does a day-to-day life look like for Tom Naughton these, these days? I mean, are you have some kind of, I mean, is it just whatever happens type of thing? I mean, live, let me ask you this. Has the move from the city to the country been a net positive for you? Would you recommend that to other people? I would absolutely. And here's the thing. Um, I grew up in Springfield, Illinois, which is not a big city, but, you know, we, we, we lived a very suburban environment. When I left there, I lived in Chicago, uh, and I mean in the city proper. I lived there for almost 15 years, met my wife there. We moved to the Los Angeles area, lived there for 11 years. We moved here, and this was my first time living in the country, really, and the idea of buying kind of a hobby farm was my, my wife's idea. Um, one of the, the many reasons I'm grateful I married her because I wouldn't have done it on my own. That was her idea. She pushed for it. And I was stunned to find out that going out on the weekend and doing heavy duty farm work that I enjoyed it. I mean, I thought at first it was going to be like, oh, this thing I have to do. And I don't know if it's something primal or whatever, but getting out there and moving heavy things and building things and getting sweaty in the sun and all that, I, I was amazed at how gratifying it was uh, in, in a way that nothing I've ever done in my uh, urban existence was. So yes, I highly recommend it. 
Now, do you, do you feel like you have the capacity to feed yourself? I mean, can could, do you think you could, you could use that period, that six acres to actually feed yourself um, and live? We understand the theory of how we would use it to feed ourselves. We have enough land and my wife's done enough research that, that we could do it. Uh, but we're not doing it now. I mean, we, we'd have to set aside some of the land and, you know, raise meat animals. Um, we did, it was, it was really because of my daughter's 4-H project. We did raise two hogs. We did raise two goats. Uh, we've had chickens. So if, if it were our goal, we could, there's enough land here with enough variety in the land that we could become sort of self-sustaining. It's just not something we've attempted to do for real yet. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's probably more work than, than many people realize to, to do that. But I mean, I guess back in the day when you didn't need software engineers, yeah, you could be farmers and ranchers. And so it well, and enough. believe me, if, if, uh, if it goes where I'm afraid it's going, where slowly but surely uh, the powers that be are going to start limiting your meat consumption and all that, oh, I will be raising meat animals <laughs> because you're not taking away my meat or telling me I'm allowed three ounces per day. I mean, I've I'm not a total carnivore like you, but meat is the primary component of my diet. It's the only way I've ever felt good and strong and energetic uh, is if meat is a heavy part of my diet, no one's taking it away, even if I have to raise the animals myself. Yeah, well, I mean, but obviously, Tom, you're, you hate the environment and you, you want to kill grandma if, if right, you right. have that sentiment, you know, <laughs> or I see that. Um and this is a thing, you know, I'm just wondering, um, you know, there's this, this tremendous push. I mean, I, I mean, I see it, I think it's fairly transparent to me, but I think other people are sort of baffled by the smoke and mirrors, but I mean, we have this, uh, you know, there's this tremendous amounts of money being poured into alternate protein, whether it's making meat out of air combined with, uh, uh, you know, some kind of microorganism or, you know, plant-based food or cell cultured meats. Um, how, how successful do you think that that is going to be? Well, I think ultimately it's going to fail. It'll take some time. Um, but first off, oh, we're going to make meat in a lab and it's going to be better. Um, excuse me. Does anyone remember when they decided we should replace butter with stuff made in a lab? How did that turn out? Uh, I think there are enough of us now who look, you know, the idea of lab grown meat and that somehow it's going to be superior. I think there are enough of us who have the attitude, you know, humans creating foods in, in, in labs does not really have a positive history as far as its impact on our health. I hope there are enough people that will just say, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not interested and that they won't get enough of a market to succeed. And if they do get enough of a market to succeed, well, congratulations, good for them. I'm not opposed to them selling crap if people will buy it. But I, I really think there's going to be enough of us who are going to say, no, I, I actually want to eat real food. Well, one of the things that, I, you know, and we have obviously a sort of an American perspective as, you know, that's where we live and that's what we see and that's where our experience, shared experiences are. But I mean, I think if you look at much of the rest of the world where, um, you know, they may not have the choice. I mean, you look at, you yeah. look at, you know, much of developing Africa, I mean, they're going to get what they get right. largely. And, and, you know, I think the problem is, you know, you say, well, I, I feel sorry for those people. They live under these uh, often uh, brutal regimes where, you know, they're lucky to even get food at all. And, uh, right. You know, if, if Beyond Meat comes in there and offs their off, you know, bribes their top officials, this is what you guys are going to eat. This is what you're going to eat. Uh, and then the question is, you know, like you said about the slowly boiling frogs and the loss of liberties, do we? Does the United States become, you know, or, or other Western countries start to develop? You know, where we lose the freedoms to where we don't have those choices anymore? Well, uh, if they have their way, of course we will. Um, Again, when I say freedom is, is a, the kind of freedom that we, we've enjoyed in the Western world for the last couple hundred years or so, it, it, it's, it's a blip in human history. Uh, it is not the natural state of things. And if you go back <clears throat> and you look at history, and again, I'm a history buff, the people in power have really never been big fans of individual freedom. Um, it, it doesn't matter if we're talking the United States or ancient cultures or whatever. 
the people in power have always wanted to control the people. In fact, the whole thing with grain farming, um, the, the, the reason agricultural societies used to invade areas that were populated by hunter gatherers and turn them into farmers was essentially so they could become supporters of the state apparatus because you can't really reliably, or at least you could not back then, put a tax on how much meat someone hunted, but you can easily tax how much grain they grow. And you basically turn people into obedient little slaves for the state, you grow the grain, we tax it, and based on your labor, you now support the state apparatus and you allow the, uh, the powerful people to live in luxury because they don't work, you're doing the work for them and they're taxing it. It is the natural state of human beings for those people to exist and to want to take away your freedom and eventually make you work for them. Um, so yes, if we allow them to, that is where it will go. And it, it will go one degree at a time, but that is where it will go, <clears throat> which is why People think I'm ridiculous when, you know, I'll put my foot down and refuse to move an inch. And come on, it's only this much. We're only asking you to wear a mask. Uh, it's like, uh, no, uh, I'm familiar enough with human history to understand that if you don't resist having your freedom taken away, even when it's one little degree, you're going to lose it. Yeah, that's, a, that's, a, that's actually a very disturbing and probably a very true message. When, you know, we often use the term they. They are going to do this, they or that. Who are the they? Can we name the they? Can we put faces to the names? Or are we just this mysterious lizard people that are out there behind the scenes pulling the things? Who are, who are these people that are uh, in control? Is it, is, it, is it President Biden? Is it, is it somebody else? Is it Bill Gates? I mean, who are the they's that you would, that you would say that, that well, is in power? Both of, <clears throat> pardon me, both of the above. Although, frankly, I don't know if, Biden knows where he is on a particular day. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure how much he's directly involved and how much people behind him are waving his arms and moving his mouth. Um, but certainly the people in the World Economic Forum are very much behind it. The people who wrote the Eat Lancet documents are very much behind it. And to, and to a large degree, these are the same people. And what we're looking at with the World Economic Forum is we are looking at billionaires telling us uh, you know, as showed up in one of their videos, which they eventually took down because they didn't realize how bad the reaction was going to be. Oh, in the future, you will own nothing and be happy. And billionaires are telling me this. And my attitude is, if owning nothing makes you happy, you go first. Get rid of everything you own as a billionaire and then tell me how happy you are. And then you can tell me this is the way to go. Um, but it is, again, throughout history, the powerful people have not been big fans of individual freedom. So who are they? They are the powerful people. Um, many of them are billionaires. Many of them are outside of government. So we are not actually aware of who they, they are. They kind of work behind the scenes. But uh, I, I, I would, if you're trying to identify who they are, just ask yourself this, who wants to take away your freedom? How do you think uh, the average person, and, you know, and again, obviously it's a collection, it's a grassroots, and when I say the average person, it's, you know, we get tens of millions of us or a billion of us, perhaps. Uh, how do you effectively sort of counter this? I mean, you know, I mean, like I said, what do you, what do you, how do you disempower those that have all the power, I suppose, if they have sort of nefarious and are there any people that are potentially allies i mean some people say well maybe elon musk is a good guy and is, is you know i mean where do you see the changing the power structure well i mean for one thing we have to as long as they will allow we need to keep shouting it you know from the mountaintops to try to get people to understand what's going on um, and it's not just people in the U.S., it's people around the world. I'm, I'm sure you've probably seen uh, the videos and tweets that Ivor Cummins puts up. Uh, he's, he's very aware that there's an agenda behind this. Uh, it's, it's, it's not about stopping a virus. It may have began that way. It's not about that now. We need to keep in touch with each other, and we need to encourage people to say hell no. And the great thing is we're starting to see it. Ironically, one of the first big hell no, we won't do this. Um, 
mass protests was in Germany. And I'm thinking there's something wrong when Germans are more likely to stand up to authority than Americans. Um, you know, <laughs> it's usually think of the historically, at least, you know, as Germans being much more enamored of authority. And I always considered the American character to be, you know, individual and anti-authority and, and actually a huge disappointment for me with all this COVID hysteria has been realizing how many of my fellow Americans are perfectly willing to become obedient sheep. To me, that's very much against the American character. And I think it's just because we've had it so good for so long, um, we've kind of lost the understanding that uh, in most cases, authority is n n not your friend. Yeah, when we see, you know, because uh, I've got, you know, you know, as we all do now, we have kind of international audiences and within our social media. And I see some people like, particularly some, not all, but many people in like Australia, New Zealand, where they're very proud of the fact that they, you know, they, they, they were very good at following directions. And they're saying, well, look at our coronavirus outcomes are far better than other, other people's and you stupid Texans or you stupid Floridians and so on and so forth. And do you see that, uh, that, do you see a growth in the Texases and the Floridas or, a, or, or more of a growth in the other, other sort of populations? No, I, I, I'm, I'm sensing more of a growth in the Texas and, and Florida approach. I mean, I understand New Zealand got their coronavirus numbers down very low. Well, if you live on a small island where you can really, truly isolate people, well, OK, that might work. By the way, it will be temporary. Because as soon as they allow people to travel again, the virus is going to do what the virus is going to do. Humans are historically lousy at stopping viruses. Um, and it's in many, in would, many ways. Would, yeah, I would, just, I would just push back on that. I think hum, normal humans, healthy humans are pretty good at stopping viruses. No, I'm sorry. I mean, humans <laughs> as a society are right, lousy yeah, but I mean, at stopping virus from spreading as individuals. Right. Oh yeah, I'm great at fighting off viruses yeah. because I know cold and flu viruses are around and I'll have coworkers drop like flies in flu season. And on a bad day, I'll go, well, that's weird. I have a sniffle and the next day it's gone. Um, but yeah, I, uh, I, I understand what you're saying. But I think the word is getting out that uh, South Dakota, absolutely no lockdowns, no mask mandates, basically nothing, um, is, you know, right there with the same part of the country with the same demographics as North Dakota, which did lockdowns, which did mass. South Dakota is doing no worse. People understand that. Florida is doing better than California. Florida, which uh, Governor DeSantis, after a long conversation with several scientists, um, and I watched that conversation online, and I was very impressed with how scientifically literate DeSantis is. I mean, he asked brilliant questions. The guy's got a lot on the ball. He fully understands what does and, and what the, sci the real science does and doesn't say. Uh, he opened up and Florida is doing better than California, even though Florida has a population that's 10 years older on average. All other things being equal, they ought to be doing worse, but they're not. So I think people are going to see enough examples of this. Here's the other thing. More and more people are coming to the understanding that a large chunk of the population is afraid only because they were told to be afraid. Um, I asked the question on Twitter, if COVID had not become the big headline, if the death numbers weren't, you know, uh, screamed on the evening news, um, if no one had responded with locks and mask, uh, lockdowns and masks and et cetera, et cetera, would you personally even know this was an unusual year? An amazing number of people said, no, I wouldn't have known anything. It'd be kind of like the Hong Kong flu, you know, in 60, 68, 69, we had a unusually bad flu come along and it killed an unusually large number of Americans. And yet most people didn't know it was happening because even if you have a larger than usual number of older Americans die, it, it, it's just not something that most people are, are, are aware of. Uh, and I think, you know, they throw up this number 500,000 people. Well, first off, I think a lot of those were died with COVID, not of COVID, but, it, it, n never mind. 
we're talking people largely in their 80s in nursing homes, people who, and I, I don't mean to sound unsympathetic, but the average lifespan in a nursing home uh, is around a year. So we're talking, you know, something like half of the people who died were people who were in nursing homes. Statistically, they were likely to die within a year anyway. Most people simply would not have been aware if this hadn't been hyped in the media, they would not have been aware that this was an unusual year. It, and, and most people who quote unquote got COVID would have said, oh, I had a cold, I had a flu. Uh, the, but we've been conditioned to panic. It's been screamed on the news, blah, 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 to make everybody fearful. I think more and more people are beginning to look around at their lives and say, but I don't know anyone who died. I don't even know anyone who got really sick. And finally starting to realize maybe the hype and the reality are rather far apart. I think we're seeing more of that. And a lot of people are just saying, for freak's sake, look, let us get back to normal. We can't live in fear forever. Yeah, I mean, if, if you could imagine the media were to shout and scream and, and every single day tally death tolls from heart attacks, diabetes, diabetes, right. and some of these other things, I mean, we would be terrified. We'd be terrified to, to eat a donut. I mean, you know, that, that yeah. this is what, you know, this is what the perception is. And just like you, I don't know, I don't personally know a single person that I've actually interacted with, you know, that's gotten sick from this, that's had right. anything more than a sniffle. Um, you know, and, and I wouldn't, you're, you're right. If, if the, the media wasn't screaming at nonstop and people weren't running around with masks, you know, I, and it just amazed me. I see people all jogging wearing a mask. I'm like, what are you, anyway. Oh my God. <laughs> it makes me kind of chuckle to myself. But um, anyway, it's been, it has been sort of an interesting time. And hopefully, like I said, hopefully enough of us will stand up, you know, grow a pair, you know, I mean, not, I mean, figuratively, not necessarily literally, but figuratively, uh, you know, just sort of say, hey, look, we're enough's enough and we're not going to go any farther. But I think with regards to, the, you know, that obviously I, my focus has been on nutrition, but I certainly see where this bleeds over into, into other areas. And I think you're absolutely right. If we don't, uh, if we don't push back, you know, was it Franklin that said, or I don't remember who was it, what was talking about, if you trade uh, uh, freedom for security, you'll have none, basically, you'll have neither, some, something along those lines. I said that's attributed to various people. Uh, I've heard it attributed to Churchill as well. Yeah. Uh, but let's just say this, some very wise people have said it, and they were absolutely correct. Um, and yeah, I'm, uh, the, the message I hope we can, we can get out to people is that the, the level of corona hysteria we are experiencing now is not actually based on the risk. It is intentional. It is designed to keep you afraid. Uh, when the numbers start going down, you know, we really only had that one, one big spike in Mar March and April. And then we've had a little bit of a winter resurgence as, as expected. But I remember during the summer when the, the numbers were really not that impressive, although they kept hyping them on the news, my wife was saying, why are they keeping the fear going? And I said, I think it's about the vaccine. I think this is about guaranteeing billions and billions of dollars uh, in vaccine sales. And if you don't keep people afraid, they're not gonna take it. Uh, so that's certainly part of it. And I think the fear is still going now as an excuse to take away, take away freedom. Um, I, I saw that uh, we were, I think, I think Biden basically said that if we're good and everyone gets enough vaccines, we'll be able to, allowed to gather for the 4th of July. And uh, yeah. <laughs> well, thank you, Emperor. Yeah, so I think that's thank, thank you for granting uh, the, the little people freedom. It's just a, a, a utter nonsense. This is supposed to be America. The government is not supposed to be the people's master in America. The government is supposed to be the people's servant. And unfortunately, a lot of people in power do not consider themselves their servants. They consider themselves our masters. But again, throughout human history, that is what powerful people have done. And I just hope more and more and more people understand they will take away your freedom if, if, if you let them. Well, Tom, it's been uh, wonderful talking to you. We've gone through an hour. This is typically what we do. Thank you so much. Continue doing what you're doing. Where can people go to follow you or find some of your, tell us about, you know, if, if they haven't seen or seen Fathead, where can they find that? And then where can they find your, your, your current uh, online presence, I suppose? So my online presence uh, was my blog, which is no longer active, that's uh, fathead-movie.com. 
Uh, I don't I don't write new posts now, but I have 10 years worth of posts um, on there that, you know, more than a thousand posts. People may find some of them interesting. Some of them were on this very topic. Uh, I have a lot of posts there on the powerful and the anointed, and it's just as relevant now as when I wrote them in many cases some years ago. Fat, uh, Fathead and Fathead Kids, those two movies can be found on Amazon Prime. The book Fathead Kids you can find on on Amazon. And then on Twitter, I am Tom D. Naughton, N-A-U-G-H-T-O-N. Perfect. So, Tom, thank you so much for spending part of your Sunday with us. Uh, good luck to your, your whatever, whatever you decide to do and look forward to chatting with you again down the road. Yeah, it was great talking to you. I appreciate it. You guys take care. We'll see you tomorrow. Everybody. Bye-bye. Okay.